Hi guys, sorry for the minute or two delay there, just making sure I had everything um, ready for you guys and that the sharing settings were all set, but everything looks good. So um, my name is Caroline, if you've never tuned in before, through Fiveable, um, and you should have a link to the slides. It should just say link to resources or something like that, and it has a link to the slides, and they should be accessible, that's what I was just checking. Um, so you guys should be all squared away to follow along. Um, as you probably know, because you signed up for this session, this is a review of unit two. Okay, so how this will work, if you've been to a review session before or anything like that, I have slides prepared with just the most important concepts from unit two. Um, as a reminder, unit two is all about cells, okay? So that's what we're gonna be talking about. Um, but this is all about you, and I wanna make sure that you're getting the most out of this experience. So if you have questions that aren't related to the things that I'm talking about, but are related to unit two, please ask them. There's an ask a question button, or you can type it into the chat box, whichever is easier. Um, but I'll be frequently checking to make sure that I'm answering all of your questions. So again, if there's something that I'm saying that you want more detail on, or you have a question about something, please just feel free to ask because that's what makes these sessions extra helpful for you guys is that you get your specific questions answered. Um, otherwise, if you don't have specific questions, I'll just run through my slides um, and go into more detail about the, the different things that are shown there. And this will be really good review. Uh, you can watch the replays right before the AP exam. Those unit reviews will be really, really helpful um, just to, to jog your memory. So even if you've already gotten through this or haven't gotten through this in your class yet, um, it will definitely become helpful when you are very stressed in May. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started and again, Feel free to stop me and ask questions at any time. That is what I am here for. Okay, so as always, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. We've been doing a lot of fun giveaways lately, um, and there's a lot of good information out there. All right, coming up soon. So obviously, we're wrapping up Unit 2. We're going to be starting Unit 3 this week. So we have a session tomorrow night and Wednesday night this week, Monday and Wednesday, um, on enzyme structure and then enzyme catalysis or... Um, being a catalyst, okay, so enzyme function. Um, and then next week we'll jump into cellular energy, cellular respiration, then I think we go back to environmental impacts and then photosynthesis. So those are huge. And we may run a couple sessions on cellular respiration and photosynthesis. So stay tuned just because those are massive topics and they're super, super important. Um, so we'll get into the really nitty gritty with that um, in unit three, which is all about energetics. Okay, specifically in this stream, I'm gonna talk about cell structure and function, most importantly function, and I'm just gonna go through the organelles that you are responsible for knowing for the AP exam. Then I'll talk about plasma membranes, which we've talked about a bajillion times if you've been a loyal follower of our streams. We'll talk about membrane, per membrane permeability and transport, tonicity and osmoregulation, cell size, and then I have some practice free response questions that we can take a look at together if we have time. But again, if there are other things that you have questions on, please, please, please feel free to ask as we are moving along here. Okay, so the major organelles, in case you are wondering which ones you are, are um, basically held responsible for, I have pictures here for you. So upper left-hand corner, and I'm gonna go into detail about all of these, don't worry. But upper left-hand corner, the vacuole, we'll talk about that. Down below, the mitochondria. In the middle there, you'll see the nucleus, the rough ER, the smooth ER would be off to the side there, and the Golgi apparatus, as well as the vesicles, okay, which we'll talk about all of those. On the right bottom, you'll see the lysosome, which is another important one that you need to be familiar with. And then up in the upper right-hand corner, you will see the chloroplast. So those are the organelles that you need to know. Um, are they ever just gonna ask you a basic question about an organelle? No, because AP Biology is way harder than that. So if they do ask you something, it will probably be embedded in another question. One that I've seen pretty frequently is like predict the most likely outcome of what would happen if a lysosome exploded inside of a cell. So they're not necessarily asking you what the lysosome does, but they're asking you what you know about it and then making you apply it to a situation. Um, so more often than not, it will just be like a part of um, a, a question as opposed to just being like, what does the mitochondria do? Which that would be great if that's what they asked you, but that is certainly not what they're going to ask you. 
Okay, so just a closer look. So I'm gonna zoom in and just talk a little bit about these organelles. I know you're probably very familiar with them. So what I'm gonna focus on um, is just how the structure and function of these things, mainly the structure, uh, how the structure affects the function. So if you're not familiar, that's a huge concept in AP Biology. And in almost everything that we'll talk about, we're gonna talk about how structure influences function, starting with enzymes um, tomorrow, right? Because that's a really, really key part of enzymes. So how does the endoplasmic reticulum affect its function? So we know that the endoplasmic reticulum makes things for us. The rough ER makes proteins. We see all the little dotted ribosomes here. They're the protein producers. And then the smooth ER makes like lipids and steroids and things like that. So, uh, a big thing here with the structure affecting the function, one, it's right next to the nucleus, which makes sense because uh, transcription is gonna happen in the nucleus and then we're gonna travel right into the rough ER for translation. Um, and then two, you'll see that we have a lot of surface area here, okay? So there's a lot of room for the production of these things um, with the surface area being so maximized. You can see, obviously, the ribosomes are on the exterior wall here. Um, so the more surface area we have, the more ribosomes we can have, the more proteins we can make. So those are really important things about the rough and smooth ER. Um, and they're also going to be really close to the Golgi apparatus, which we'll talk about in a second, but that's also um, a good structure function combo. Okay, so those are pretty basic. I'm sure you guys are familiar and have known those for forever. Oops, wrong thing. Okay. Golgi, right next door. So the Golgi looks like pancakes. That's what I think of it as. Um, but the Golgi is going to synthesize our proteins and package them for transport. So you can notice that, again, it's very close to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Why? Because we're picking up proteins. So it makes sense that those would be next to each other. And you'll notice these little vesicles are going to bring the product from rough ER to Golgi. Then we're gonna get processed here. Some things that happen in the Golgi, we might make glycoproteins. So not just a protein, but a protein with a sugar group on it. Okay, glycoproteins, super, super uh, important. We have them in the plasma membrane and all sorts of places. So those are the kinds of synthesizing things that the Golgi are going to do. And then they're also going to package um, for the the end location of that thing. So whether they're gonna send that thing out of the cell or to another part of the cell, that all happens here. So, if, you know, I know a lot of teachers use like the FedEx analogy. This is like your FedEx um, location where they're sorting and packaging things for transport. Um, so, and then these little vesicles are like the vehicles that then transport those products to either outside of the cell or to other parts of the cell. So that's our Golgi. The big thing is processing. So sometimes that means chopping, cutting things off, adding sugars, adding whatever it may be, and then getting them ready for transport. Okay, the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, everyone's favorite thing. Um, big thing here, we know that this is the this is the site of two of three parts of cellular respiration. So previewing next week, but you have glycolysis, which does not happen inside of the mitochondria, but then you have the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, which do happen inside of the mitochondria. Um, so the important thing here with structure and function, you'll notice all of these, um, these like wrappings of membrane, okay, super, super important, increases the surface area, okay? So if this was just an organelle, the surface area would just be like the outside of my hands right now. But once you start having those infoldings, the surface area, right, like you can see my fingers here, increases substantially, which is important because that membrane is used for the electron transport gene, which is where we make the majority of ATP in eukaryotic cells. So by having these infoldings of membranes, and this is an, again, important structure and function combo, um, by having that, we're increasing the surface area exponentially, and therefore we have more space um, for our electron transport chains, which are gonna be all throughout here, making a ton of ATP. So that's what's happening in the membrane, and then in the space in between, which we call the matrix, that's where we have the Krebs cycle happening. Okay. And again, if you're not familiar with the words that I'm saying, that is a-okay. We are going to go through that next week when we talk through cellular respiration, um, which is a large and important concept. Um, another cool thing that I'll just throw out here is that mitochondria have their own DNA. Um, on the slide where I talk about the chloroplast, I think it's the next slide, um, we can talk more about that. But this is because of the endosymbiont theory, which if you watch the cell compartmentalization um, screencast, then you know this, but endosymbiont theory states that 
the mitochondria and the chloroplasts were once free living prokaryotes. It makes, um, or there's a lot of proof for that, but, but one of the biggest pieces is that both mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own set of DNA and no other organelle does. And that DNA is circular. And obviously our DNA is not circular, but prokaryotic DNA is circular. Um, so that's just more proof le leading to um, thinking that these guys were once freestanding prokaryotes. Um, kind of like a fun fact that will, again is a preview for our unit five on heredity. Um, the mitochondrial DNA that you have is 100% from your mom um, because the mitochondria that you get is in the egg. Um, it's not like fused together like everything else is. It's just in the egg. So 100% of your mitochondrial DNA comes from your mom. Um, and that comes into play when we talk about some of these uh, genetically inherited disorders that are actually carried on the mitochondrial DNA. Okay, enough of that. We know what it does, we know what happens there, and we know why, and we know why we have all of that surface area of membrane in the inside. Okay, so then chloroplasts, similar. You can see the chloroplast DNA. Again, that's unique. This is kind of a not great depiction of the chloroplast, um, but something to notice is that we have these two general sections. We have these thylakoid membranes. I like to think of them as pancakes because pancakes are delightful. And then we have this plasma membrane space or stroma is what it's called, um, which you can see over here, stroma. And that's going to be where our light independent reactions take place. But our light dependent reactions are going to take place in these pancakes. Again, lots of plasma membrane because in those reactions, there's also an electron transport chain that takes place in the membrane. So when you learn about photosynthesis, you'll learn about that a lot more, but just know that all of these stacks, again, increase surface area, similarly to the mitochondria, which is super, super important because um, of the electron transport chains that happen in both of those organelles, okay? So, and that happens in the membrane. Um, so, but more on the intricacies of that, obviously next week, but just know that again, structure meets function here. Um, and that's why we have those structures in place. And that's why um, chloroplast has its own DNA. So here is just a, a little example of what I was talking about with endosymbiont theory or primary endosymbiosis. We have a eukaryotic cell, and then this is a cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria are photosynthetic bacteria that gets engulfed by this cell, and that cell is obviously now has a has a advantage as far as natural selection goes because they have something inside of them that's making all of their energy for them. So these these highly energetic molecules were engulfed by other cells, and that was evolutionarily beneficial. So they're surviving and reproducing more until we have this whole grouping of cells that has either a chloroplast or a mitochondria or both inside of it. Um, and that was kind of how the eukaryotic cell was born. Um, so important theory to know about. I do see a good amount of questions about that on the AP exam um, and have for, for many years. Okay. Any questions about any of the organelles that we've talked about so far? I know I'm not going into a ton of detail, but it's because I, I, I assume you guys have a pretty decent knowledge of these and we can just kind of talk about some of the higher level stuff. Okay. Lysosomes, super important. So lysosomes, lice things, L-Y-S, when you see that, that means to break apart. Okay. So next week when we do cellular respiration, you'll learn about glycolysis, okay, which is breaking apart glucose, glyco, glucose, lysis to break down. The lysosome breaks things down. So it has hydrolytic or like breaking apart enzymes inside of it. And usually what it does is it will join up with another compartment of the cell and release those enzymes, which is what you can see happening here in the middle, um, right here. And those toxic enzymes are gonna break down. So in this case, we're dealing with a macrophage. So this would be a, an immune system cell that picks up a bacteria or a bacterium, I should say. The lysosome fuses with this, they call it the phagosome, which is the, the compartment that picks up. This is an example of endocytosis. The bacteria, lysosome fuses, and all of those hydrolytic enzymes break down. As you can see, the bacteria, and then get that gets released. So. Obviously, lysosomes are working overtime in our immune system cells, the cells that are picking up the bacteria and the viruses and all the other sorts of stuff that our body is trying to fight. But these also work all the time if um, something in the cell is broken or um, old or needs to be recycled, um, it will take care of all of those things too. So it breaks down, recycles, um, 
all sorts of stuff due to the hydrolytic enzymes that are inside of it. Um, so the lysosome kind of has a pr protective barrier around it because most things would break down in the presence of those enzymes. So if this thing burst, um, the whole cell would die just because those enzymes are going to non-discriminately break down everything inside of the cell. Um, so very important that those are contained. Okay, and then vacuoles and vesicles, I put these on the same page because sometimes students get confused just because they sound similarly. Vacuoles are on the left. Vacuoles are just our storage molecules. They're much more common in plant cells than in animal cells because plant cells will use them, a central water vacuole, to hold a lot of water just because they can't get up and grab a drink of water when they feel thirsty. So they're gonna need to hold on to that water because it's obviously a life bringing thing for a plant and all living things. Um, and so they have that central water vacuole. So again, vacuoles are gonna be much more apparent in something like a plant, uh, but animals have them for storage purposes as well. Vesicles on the other hand are different. Vesicles are the little carriers that take things around. So I always think vesicles, vehicles, vesicles, vehicles, um, because they're driving things either into or out of the cell. This is an example of endocytosis, and I'm going to get into that in a second. So I'm not going to explain it too much right now, um, but they can also be used for exocytosis, getting things out of the cell. Um, but they're just little like membrane bubbles, bubbles of the plasma membrane that will move around um, and transport items. So vesicles, vehicles, and then vacuoles are for storage. Um, but again, they sound similar. So those are the uh, major organelles that you need to know. So now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the plasma membrane, which again, if you have been tuning in, you know all about. So I'm just gonna skim over this. And if you want more detail, we have, you can obviously watch the reviews because we have a specific um, stream just on the plasma membrane. We have a couple streams on, on membrane transport. Um, but major thing with our plasma membrane is that it is part phosphate, part lipid, um, which is important because it gives it two different properties. We call it amphiphilic, um, like amphibian, right? Live in, lives in two different lands. Amph amphiphilic is going to be two different um, like molecular types. Um, so we have this outside red area. These are our hydrophilic heads. That's the phosphate group. Okay, phosphate is polar. Um, it has an unequal distribution of charge. It's usually a negative molecule. And so these things are going to be water loving. We have water inside and outside of our cells. So that's awesome for um, for us because that's the part that's interacting with the water. And then inside this bilayer, we have fatty acid tails. Fatty acids are part of the lipid family. They're incredibly hydrophobic. We know that oil and water don't mix. Um, and these things are gonna be the real gatekeepers. So anything that is polar or water-like or, or hydrophilic is not going to be able to get through this area. Whereas anything that is non-polar and hydrophobic will be able to get through this area. So they're the controllers of that. And that's really, really important to know for when we talk about the methods of transport. Okay, cool. So with that are types of transport. Um, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, active transport, and then endo and exocytosis. So you definitely need to be familiar with all this vocabulary and the types of molecules that would utilize each type of transport. Um, so I can run through that quickly. But simple diffusion is just the movement of small nonpolar molecules from high concentration to low concentration. So with the concentration gradient, and that requires no energy, it is passive, okay? So we are always moving with the concentration gradient. And if it's across the plasma membrane, we are moving small nonpolar molecules because that is what can get through the fatty acid tails. Facilitated diffusion is also passive. So sometimes students forget this because they see, you know, that we're using a, pro a, a transport protein and they think that that means that energy is required. It is not. Um, it's still passive, no energy. These are small polar molecules. So these are molecules that would normally not be able to get through the plasma membrane due to the fatty acid tails, but they're gonna use a transport protein to help and they're still moving with the concentration gradient. So from high concentration to low concentration, um, that is part of the reason that this process is um, passive, okay? Because we're moving with the concentration gradient. Molecules like to move that way. They just need some help getting through the plasma membrane. 
And I have pictures of all of these, so don't panic if you forget. Um, active transport, active, if you're active, you're using energy. So this uses energy, it's used for bulky molecules, so molecules that are bigger, it can't get through the plasma membrane on their own, and for molecules traveling against the gradient, the concentration gradient. So from low concentration to high concentration, that happens very frequently. A great example of that would be the sodium potassium pump, which forces both sodium and potassium against their concentration gradient so that we can have thoughts and process things across our neurons. Um, and I give an example of that if you watch the facilitated diffusion, um, I have it in facilitated diffusion. Yes, the facilitated diffusion stream. Um, towards the end, I give an example of active transport in comparison, or maybe it's mechanisms of transport. Now I'm blanking. I'll try to find it for you guys, but there's definitely examples there um, for you. And then endo and exocytosis are also versions of active transport, um, but here's where we're moving things into and out of the cell, usually in large quantity. And I'm gonna show you a picture of that um, and what that looks like, but it involves vesicles. Looks like we have a question. So lay, so what's an example of a common molecule that would use active transport? So any any molecule that's moving against its concentration gradient would be using active transport, but some common ones would be sodium and potassium in the sodium potassium pump. Um, so with an action potential, we're forcing sodium outside of the cell where there's already lots of sodium, and we're for forcing potassium inside of the cell where there's already lots of potassium. So because we're forcing things against the gradient, we use the sodium potassium pump which uses ATP or energy, and that's probably the most common example of active transport. Um, but we we also you know create concentration gradients like when we when you talk about the electron transport chain, um, hydrogens will be pumped across the membrane to form a concentration gradient, um, and that's also active transport. We can't use usually we can't. Um, actively transport small nonpolar molecules like oxygen or carbon dioxide because they can do simple diffusion, okay? So if you can do simple diffusion, we can't really force you across the plasma membrane because you'll just come right back through, right? There's no barrier to you getting through the membrane. Um, whereas usually for polar molecules, like sodium is charged, Na+, potassium is charged, K+, and hydrogen is charged, H+. All of those things can't get through the membrane on their own, so it's much easier to create a concentration gradient using active transport. So hopefully that answers your question, but the sodium potassium pump with sodium and potassium are gonna be really common molecules that use active transport in our neurons all the time. Okay, um, let's see some examples. So simple diffusion, I just wanted you to see the kind of the concentration gradient here, and you also see that these molecules are moving through the membrane without the help of a transport protein. And again, that's because they're small and nonpolar, and they're therefore able to get through the, the fatty acid tails. You'll notice that over time, if, if left to do so, they will equal out, same amount inside and outside of the cell. And that's why we can't really force a concentration gradient for something that can just get through the membrane, because it'll just spread itself out if we do that. Um, so over time, we have equal concentrations inside and outside. And again, there's no use of a transport protein here because these things are able to get through the membrane on their own. Facilitated diffusion, super common examples uh, that I gave. So sodium and potassium can also use this, and they do use this in an action potential. Um, so we force them against their concentration gradient and then we allow them to come back through the sodium channel or the potassium channel. Um, also with water, so water is polar um, and obviously hydrophilic because it is water. Um, so there, it's gonna use facilitated diffusion quite frequently. Um, we call those transport proteins aquaporins because it's a pore that water comes through. And I have some examples of that coming up, um, but they're going to be a major, major user of facilitated diffusion. But anything that has a charge or is polar like water uh, is going to use a transport protein. You will notice that we are still moving with the concentration gradient. So out here we have a higher concentration of molecules. In here we have a lower concentration of molecules. So we're moving molecules from high to low, um, as you can see. And uh, this is still using no energy as a reminder. All right, active transport. I forgot that I put the sodium potassium pump 
on here, um, but you can see it here. So we have a high concentration of sodium outside of the cell and a high concentration of potassium inside of the cell. And yet we're forcing more potassium inside of the cell where it's more concentrated and we're forcing more sodium outside of the cell where it is more concentrated. Okay, so both of these things are moving against the gradient and you can see that we're breaking down ATP to do this process because it is, um, it requires the use of energy when we are creating concentration gradients such as this. Um, so there's your, your example with our sodium potassium pump. And again, then when we have a nerve impulse, we will open up some, some gated, gated channel. So we'll open up a sodium channel and we'll allow the sodium to come inside of the cell from high concentration to low concentration. So that's an example of facilitated diffusion. Um, and same with potassium. Then we'll open potassium channels and potassium will move outside of the cell from high concentration to low concentration. Again, facilitated diffusion. So in a nerve cell, we are constantly doing both active transport and facilitated diffusion with sodium and potassium molecules. Okay. Then lastly, endo and exocytosis. So endocytosis on the left-hand side, endo, you're bringing things in, okay? So into the cell. Um, and so you can see here, like uh, phagocytosis all the way on the left is an example. That's where you're bringing in a large solid item. Like in this case, we're bringing in, it looks like, uh, or like a red, uh, maybe like a blood cell or something like that, or a bacteria, something like that but you'll notice that the membrane wraps up around that item and then will actually seal off and become a vesicle. So the membrane itself is what becomes that vesicle. Um, and then when, you know, something exocytosis, um, that vesicle will become part of the membrane again. So it kind of is just like a recycling process of plasma membrane. Then penocytosis, and you don't need to be super familiar with this vocabulary, um, but penocytosis is for fluids. So phagocytosis is for solids. Penocytosis is bringing in fluids from the external environment. So we're bringing in some sort of particle here in the fluids. And then there's receptor mediated endocytosis, um, which is something is just meeting up with a receptor. So that could be like a cell signaling pathway, um, or it also could be like a specialized immune system cell that's picking up a pathogen. But all of these are just examples of bringing things inside of the cell using the plasma membrane. On the right hand side, we have exocytosis, and here's where we're producing things. So you see our Golgi making its vesicles, and these vesicles are destined for the plasma membrane. So they're joining up with the plasma membrane, and you'll notice that the vesicle then just becomes part of the plasma membrane as it releases its contents into um, the surrounding area. So exo, we're releasing things from inside to the outside. Endo, we're bringing things from the outside to the inside. But both, we're utilizing that plasma membrane to convert it into a vesicle or vice versa. Any questions about those processes? I know I just zoomed through them pretty quickly. Awesome. Okay, so those are our major transports. So, so far we've gone through the major organelle, organelles. Um, after endocytosis, where would the vesicles go? Oh, so that's a really good question. It depends on um, what they're carrying. So for the most part, they're probably going to fuse with a lysosome to break down um, like on the left hand side with phagocytosis, that's oftentimes what would be happening because that's usually used for like a bacteria or a pathogen. Um, but if they're bringing in like cell signaling molecules, then they might head to the nucleus um, where those cell signaling molecules will be put to work um, to maybe start some some transcription process or something like that. Um, so it really just depends on on what's being picked up. And that oftentimes just depends on the receptors that are on that portion of plasma membrane and what that thing picks up. Um, so some, again, sometimes it'll fuse with the lysosome, sometimes it might head to the nucleus, or sometimes it might go, yeah, it can go a number of places in the cell just depending on, on what is being picked up. But those would probably be the two major areas and then it'll just fuse with whatever membrane is located in those areas. And the plasma membrane just kind of continually gets shifted from place to place, if that makes sense. Great question. Okay, so we've kind of talked through all the different types of organelles and why they look the way that they do and what their purpose is. Um, we've talked through all the different types of transport, which require energy, which don't, which molecules utilize those. Um, all super, super important. 
And then uh, we'll jump into a little bit more spe specificity with like the movement of water. Um, so that is the session that I ran last week that was a little bit shorter just because I um, got put on it at the last minute. Um, but I can go into some more detail about the movement of water um, tonight if anyone has any questions. Um, but it's really just a glorified version of facilitated diffusion. So it's usually not too hard to understand, um, but we'll go through some key vocabulary. So movement of water, we know is an example of facilitated diffusion. We're moving from high to low, so we're not creating a concentration gradient. Water will just move to where there's less water, uh, and it's going to use special channels called aquaporins because water is polar and therefore cannot get through the cellular membrane without the help of a transport protein. Again, example of facilitated diffusion. So osmosis, the big thing that you need to remember here are the three different um, solutions that can be present. Um, so you can have a hypertonic, isotonic, or hypotonic solution. Um, and that vocabulary is key to know and then process. So a couple ways to remember this here, and again, if you tuned in last week, you know this, um, but a hypertonic environment means two things. It means that there is more solute, and when I say solute, that means like dissolved substances, usually ions, things like that, stuff, proteins um, are a big one. There's more stuff or solute outside of the cell than there is inside of the cell, okay? So that means two things for us. We have a higher concentration of other things outside of the cell, which means we have a lower concentration of water outside of the cell, okay? Because there's other stuff out there. So there's less water molecules out there. So what that means is water is going to move from the higher concentration of itself inside of the cell to the lower concentration of itself outside of the cell. So you see water is leaving these cells and they shrivel up, okay? My easy way to remember this is that if you are hyper, you run outside. So water is running out of these cells, okay? And then you can think to yourself, okay, it's going from a high concentration to a low concentration. That means there's less water outside of these cells, which means there's more solute outside of these cells. Okay, and that's kind of an easy way to walk through the process and really think about how things are moving. But you need to be familiar with concentration gradients and how things normally move in order to get a good understanding there. Questions about hypertonic? Because I can pull up a whiteboard and show and show you guys if, if, if you feel like you need it. If you guys feel like you're good, we'll just keep moving on. Up to you. I'll take your silence as feeling good. Okay, don't hesitate to ask a question if you have one, of course. So isotonic's the easiest. We just have an equal concentration of solute inside and outside of the cell. So water is moving in and out. It doesn't mean that water is not moving. It just means there's no net movement of water, okay? So the, the water that comes in is the same amount as the water that's leaving. So equal concentration of water and therefore solute inside and outside. And then on the right hand side, we have our hypotonic situation. This is where we have more water outside of the cell than inside of the cell. So if you're really, really, really overly hydrated or something like that, you might have more water in your um, fluids than you actually do inside of your cells. So there's more stuff, there's more solute inside of your cells than there is in the fluids surrounding your cells. And so therefore water is gonna move to where there's less water, where there's more solute which is inside of the cell, and these cells will get bigger and eventually burst. So I think hypo hippo, hippos are big, right? They're also lazy. So if you're a hypo hippo, you're lazy, you go inside to lay on the couch, okay? So if you're hyper, you run outside, water leaves. If you are hypo hippo, you go inside, lazy hippo, and you get bigger like a hippo, okay? Any more questions about hyper iso hypo? No? Okay. The wording there can just get a little bit confusing, but if you remember that kind of like funky way of remembering things, um, I find that that just helps students because then you can kind of work backwards and understand why water would be moving that way and where there's a higher concentration of solute. Okay, same example, and again, this is the same a review if you were here last week, um, but plant cells are just slightly different in that they're actually okay with being in a hypotonic environment. Um, they can hold that extra water. You'll see that vacuole, which we just talked about. Um, so they're cool with that because they have the cell wall protecting them, so they're not gonna easily burst like an animal cell would, um, and they also are okay with taking on more water just because, again, 
They have to store water. They're not like an animal that can get a drink of water when they're thirsty. They cannot do that. Um, you'll also see that they're highly, highly affected by a hypertonic, like dehydrated environment um, with water leaving. You'll see the plasma membrane actually pulls away from that cell and that plant cell will die. Um, so just like a slight difference there, plants are still okay with being in an isotonic environment too, um, but just the slight difference there with the hypotonic environment. Um, my real life examples from, from last time, um, hypotonic environment, um, or isotonic environment, I should say, like when you get an injection, um, an IV fluids, it's 0.9% solute. That's because your cells are about 0.9% solute. And so therefore they're creating an isotonic environment for you when they are injecting you with that solution, as opposed to pure water, which would create a hypotonic solution. And your, a lot of your cells might burst. Um, also really important with plants, plants have these guard cells on their stoma, which are the openings in their leaf. When they have lots and lots of water in them, they swell up, um, water goes into the guard cells and that they open the stoma so that we can allow for gas exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. When they are dehydrated, there's less water filling those cells up and the stoma will close in order to prevent the release of water vapor and therefore the loss of water into the environment. Um, Lastly, our friend, the paramecium on the right hand side, um, our cute little friend there, he has a very special um, contractile vacuole um, and that vacuole can actually pump water out. So if that if that guy finds himself in a hypotonic environment with lots of water coming in, it is capable of pumping that water back out so that it does not burst. Um, so just some examples. I know we went over them last week. If you were here, if you weren't, now you know them, um, but just puts everything into context. Okay, before we move on to cell size, any other questions about anything that I've talked about so far? Again, I know I'm going quickly because if I spent as much time as we did going through these things the first time, it would take hours. Okay, so cell size is really, really, really important. And um, I can tell you more, actually, let's jump ahead aside. So why is it important? Um, because the surface area of the cell, so when we talk cell size, we're talking about a surface area to volume ratio, okay? So how much surface area do we have in comparison to how much volume do we have? Cells would like, ideally, the small or the sorry, the largest surface area to volume ratio. So we want lots of surface area. That's our plasma membrane with not a whole lot of volume. Why is that? Well, we need a ton of surface area because that's how the cell does everything. That's how we exchange energy, waste, gases, CO2, oxygen, get rid of all of our toxic waste products, get all of the things that we need to create energy. Everything happens through the plasma membrane, right? I'm sure you've realized this by now because we've talked about it so darn much, right? We need lots and lots of surface area, but the more volume that you have, the more energy you need to keep that cell alive. So we don't want to waste energy. So we want a very small volume, okay? So that we don't have to waste a lot of energy with a very large surface area so that we have a large amount of space to exchange energy, waste, and gases, okay? So our surface area to volume ratio is literally just surface area. I'm going to write this in the box. That is not what I meant to do. Surface area divided by volume. And we want it to be as large as possible, right? Because we want the most surface area with the least volume. So we want a large numerator and a small denominator. So therefore, our surface area to volume ratio is very, very high. So you can see the sizes here that we have. Um, in comparison of how we can see these things. So plant and animal cells are like 50, somewhere between 10 and 100 micrometers. They're very, very small, but we can see them with a light microscope. Um, we cannot see them with the naked eye, okay? So there's the difference there. Um, and what this really looks like, so what you can see is the smaller something is, the larger its surface area to volume ratio. So if a large particle is broken down into smaller particles, the total surface area increases while the volume decreases. So the total volume is the same, but the volume of each individual piece decreases. So if a large particle is broken down into smaller particles, the total surface area increases. Increasing the surface area can increase the rate of a reaction as more surface area is available for that reaction. Makes sense, right? This is what we were just talking about. 
So as you can see, we have this one cube. And again, our total volume has not changed yet, but the individual volumes have gotten way, 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 way smaller, whereas our surface area of the total thing has increased a ton. So here we have a surface area of 150 millimeters squared, whereas down here, when we've broken it up into 512 particles, we have a surface area of 1,200 millimeters squared. Okay, so almost 10 times the surface area where we've decreased the volume pretty substantially. So our surface area to volume has uh, ratio has skyrocketed. So I've seen this show up on AP exams being like which of these shapes um, is the most, I guess, like energy efficient. And it'll give you four different shapes and their surface area to volume ratio. And you would need to pick the one with the highest surface area to volume ratio because that allows them to do the most energy exchange the, the fastest reaction with the, the least waste of energy. So it makes them the, the um, best at being a cell, um, which is the goal here. So that's why our cells are so small. So we're not just like one giant cell. Obviously, our cells are specialized, et cetera. Um, common misconception, though, and we'll talk about this more in unit four, every single one of our cells, and when you think about it, it makes sense, obviously, but every single one of our cells has the same DNA in it. Right, whether you're a skin cell or a hair cell or a heart muscle cell or an intestinal cell, even though all of those cell types look vastly different, they all have the same identical DNA, right? All of our cells have the same DNA in them. They're just expressed differently. And that's really what chapter or unit four is all about is gene expression and how that can possibly happen and gene regulation. Um, but your skin cell has the same exact DNA in it as a cell in your eye, as a cell in your intestine. Um, so just an important fact, because again, you know that when I say it, but sometimes students get confused and think that they actually have different DNA in them because they look so different and do such different things. Um, the only cell that varies is the red blood cell, which does not have a nucleus in it or, or really any organelles. Um, they're pretty much empty in order to just fill their role of holding oxygen for us. Um, but. There you have it. So cell size, um, what do you really need to take away from that? Just really that the surface area to volume ratio should be as large as possible in order for cells to be as energy effective as possible. Um, just seen that come up a bit. Okay. Um, right, right, right. Talk about that. All right, so we're, we're actually at the point where we can just do some practice questions unless someone or anyone has topics that they want to go through that I have not covered yet. Anything that I haven't covered yet? That you're still confused on for unit two? It's kind of a quick unit. Okay, so um, what I have then is just two free response questions. Um, they're both short free response questions. It is super, super important, and I know we did a practice one last week, but it is super important that you are practicing as many free response as possible um, and looking at as many AP rubrics as possible in order to best understand how you are going to be evaluated. Because remember that that's 50% of your grade and the College Board rubrics are not easy. Um, so we're gonna take a look at a few. So this is question six from the 2018 AP exam. Um, so I'm gonna pull, whoop, I'm gonna pull that up. I'm gonna send you the link to the scoring guidelines. So these are all public. You can find them. You just wanna make sure it's 2013 or above. Um, and just know that when you're pulling up old FRQs, you're gonna see eight questions. You guys only have six questions. Um, so it's shorter, they've shortened it, but they give you the same amount of time. So you guys got lucky there. Um, so just know that you will not have as many questions as you're seeing on these practice ones. But if you scroll down to question six here, that's the one that I have pulled up for us. It's worth three points. Um, and it asks you to do a few things. So it's talking about cystic fibrosis, which is a common, um, not super common, but it's a genetic disorder um, that involves the CFTR protein. So it says cystic fibrosis is a genetic condition that's associated with defects in the CFTR protein. The CFTR protein is a gated ion channel. Okay. So it is a, a transport molecule um, that would be used for facilitated diffusion. That's what that's telling me that requires ATP. So actually 
that's an example of active transport, um, that requires ATP binding in order to allow chloride ions to diffuse across the membrane. So it's a transport protein that's used for active transport, and I know that because it requires ATP, and it allows chloride ions to diffuse across the membrane. Chloride ions are charged, so we know that they can't get through the membrane without the help of a transport protein. Okay, so part A says, in the provided model of a cell, draw arrows to describe the pathway for production of a normal CFTR protein from gene expression to final cellular location. Okay, so if you know anything about protein production, so students got really confused. This was a very low scoring free response question, but it's actually pretty straightforward. So students got confused, but they're just asking you, do you know the pathway for the production of a protein? Okay. Hopefully the answer is yes. So we know with protein production, of course this is now not gonna go away. I hate this thing. Google Slides are the worst. So we start in the nucleus, that's what this is. I know you can't see it because of this thing blocking, but we start in the nucleus, right? Because that's where the DNA is, that's where transcription occurs, okay? So you would need to draw an arrow from the nucleus to the endoplasmic reticulum because look, all of these ribosomes, or you could pick this one, they let you do that too. But all of these ribosomes are where proteins are gonna be produced. Then we know that proteins get processed in the Golgi apparatus, so you had an arrow there. And then lastly, we had to have an arrow from the Golgi to the plasma membrane because it's a transport protein, okay, that allows things into the cell. So that's gonna exist in the plasma membrane, like all of the transport that we've been talking about. So truly just arrow, arrow, arrow got you your first point. And all you needed to know there is how a protein is made. Okay. Part B, identify the most likely cellular location of the ribosomes that synthesize the CFTR protein. Okay, the answer here is rough endoplasmic reticulum because that's where most proteins are made. And you know that because we've just reviewed it. Um, so it's more likely that they're gonna be made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum than anywhere else in the cell because that's where proteins are made and that's where the most high concentration of ribosomes is. So are there some free ribosomes? Yes, we can see the dots floating around in the cell, but it's much, much more likely that protein we synthesized in the high, highest concentration of um, ribosomes, which is in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So that's all you needed to say for part B. It is synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Wow. You guys already, just from this little review, would have at least gotten two out of three points, and you would have been way ahead of the national average for this question. Then part C, identify the most likely cellular location of a mutant CFTR protein that has an amino acid substitution in the ATP binding site. Okay, so now we have a mutant we have a, a mutant um, protein, but the only thing that's mutated is the ATP binding site. Nothing to do with the actual rest of the protein. So the most likely cellular location for this is going to be in the plasma membrane because it's a transport protein, right? And the only thing affected here is its ability to bind ATP. It doesn't say anything about its like structural changes or anything that would inhibit its ability to still be in the plasma membrane. So you just need to know that a transport protein would be located in the plasma membrane in order to get that point. I think those are three easy points as long as you have a pretty good understanding, but students just got confused with what the question was asking. Um, but again, that's why we're gonna practice so much with these free response, because a lot of the times they're easier than what you might think when you read them the first time, just because they're throwing in things that you've never heard of. You may never have never heard of cystic fibrosis, or you may have heard of it, but you've never heard of the CFTR protein, and it doesn't affect your ability to answer the question. So that's a huge part of AP Bio, is just being okay with not understanding all of the words that they're giving you. You still understand the concepts behind them, um, but you can't get thrown off. That's like the, the number one reason why students get overwhelmed and, and don't do so well, is if they get if they feel like they have to know everything in this question in order to get the right answer. Um, because I just showed you, as long as you know what a transport protein does, and as long as you know how proteins are made, you can answer every part of this question. Okay. Next question, also about transport. Um, this was question eight, so the last question on last year's AP exam. So let me pull that up really quick. Um, it's 2019 solutions. And again, I highly suggest that you look at these rubrics frequently. Okay, so this is gonna be all the way at the end here because this is question nine, sorry, eight. What am I saying? There is no question nine. Okay, um, and I'll give you a second so I'll, I can read through it with you and then we can kind of talk through this. 
So we're given, okay, so it says a table one changes in morning glory petal cells during flower opening. So there's some changes in the cells based on whether we have a bud, which is on the left-hand side. We'll notice that we have a vacuole with a pH of 6.6, .6, so it's slightly acidic, okay? That's what that means to me. If I look up at the vacuole, I notice that the vacuole has a lot of hydrogen ions in it, okay? So that makes sense that that would be acidic and that we have a red flower that has a small cell volume. Then on the right-hand side, we have an open flower, and now I'm noticing that this vacuole is now a pH of 7.7, .7, so it's a little bit more neutral towards the basic side, actually, and I'll notice that now we actually have a lot of potassiums instead of hydrogens inside of the vacuole, which makes sense of why we're not as acidic, and our flower is blue, and the cell volume is large. So all of that is something that I would do. So I'm, I'm always going to mimic like how I would attempt these questions. That's all what I would do before I even started reading the question. So I've just fully analyzed the difference between a bud and an open flower and why. It's notice, I'm noticing that we're, we have a change in, in protons. We have a change in, in hydrogen ions. Same difference there. Okay. So that's what I would do first. Then I see, then I'll start reading the actual question. So the petal color of the Mexican morning glory, I definitely would not read that scientific name because it just wastes your brain space. Changes from red to blue and the petal cells swell during flower opening. The pigment heavenly blue something, again, I'm not gonna waste my brain space saying that out in my head, is found in the vacuole of petal cells. Petal color is determined by the pH of the vacuole. A model of a morning glory petal cell before and after flower opening is shown in table one. All right, part A, identify the cellular component in the model that's responsible for the increase in the pH of the vacuole during flower opening. Okay, so every bolded word that you see is worth a point. So part A is worth two points. Identify and describe. So the first thing we need to do is identify who's responsible for the increase in pH. Okay, let's see who is responsible. I'm looking up here. And I'm looking at what's different between our bud and our open flower. And it's the, if you um, take a look at the rubric, it's, or take a look here, this guy is inactive and then becomes active, which is pumping the hydrogens out, which would make it more basic and pumping the potassium ions in. Okay. So it says identify, oh, silly thing. Identify the cellular component responsible for the increase in pH. It's the KH transport protein. Okay, that's the only thing that also changes between these two things. Everything else stays the same. Um, so we have an inactive to an activated KH transport protein. And again, it's pumping hydrogens out, which is going to make it an increase of the pH. Second point comes from describing the component's role in changing the pH. So here's where you need to talk about the loss of hydrogen ions. If you lose hydrogen ions, you're getting more basic. But that's easy enough to say um, based on the KH transport protein. And then lastly, a researcher claims that the activation of the transport protein causes the vacuole to swell with water. Provide reasoning. Okay, so here we can talk about osmosis, which is what we just reviewed. We are putting more solutes inside of the cell, so water will follow, right? Because if there's more solute, there's less water. Okay, so that's an easy way to explain what we just kind of talked about. Um, and that what, they, what they take as points here is saying that the concentration of solute or the concentration of potassium is increasing inside of the vacuole, or they say the solute is moving into the vacuole, making it hypertonic, lowering water potential. Okay, so the cell is hypertonic in compar comparison, the, or you could say the outside of the cell is hypotonic, okay, because water is moving in. Um, so either of those you could say, but as long as you talk about the concentration of solute increasing, you get your point there because water will follow. Okay, so a lot of things that we just reviewed today show up on these. And again, this was another very low scoring question. So both of these questions, if you could even just get two points, you're way ahead of the national average. I think the national average for this question was like point, point 0.6, so less than one. Um, so if you can just get a point or two here, you're already ahead of the national average, which puts you in a good spot um, just by being kind of familiar with some of the cellular transport business. Okay. Well, that is all I have scheduled. If you have any other questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Otherwise, have a great week. Um, enjoy. Hopefully, you're enjoying some beautiful fall weather wherever you are. Here in Chicago, we definitely are. Um, 
and join us this week. Tune into some sessions. We're going to be talking about enzymes. They are super, super important. Um, otherwise, again, I hope you have a great week and I'll see you the next time I'm streaming. Um, and again, if you have a question, you want to chat it in the box, I'd be more than happy to stay on um, and answer it for you. But otherwise, have a great, great rest of your night. Bye, guys. Thank you so much.